Now, part of that plan is that we have a conviction to uh, really expand our college ministry. We're so grateful for our college ministry, for all the people that serve. I know we have uh, our SMC, UCLA, and Pepperdine Ministries. Amen. We have some other smaller schools, Otis College, uh, Loyola Marymount nearby. But this area, some of the best schools in the world are right here. And we want to expand the campus ministry in a powerful way. And I'm so grateful for Kenny Izachuku, who's been serving, leading our campus ministry. Uh, he's up at Pepperdine. Uh, he's got about a year left, a little less than a year, to complete his Master's of Divinity. And I'm really proud of him. He's done incredible things up at Pepperdine. But what's happened is since he's in his full-time uh, school and working almost full-time, uh, really our work at UCLA, we've had Rachel serving valiantly and our students serving valiantly, but it's been really hard to get the momentum that we need to get. And so I really want us to bring on a campus minister to work at UCLA and SMC and partner helping Kenny so we can have a really the hallmark campus ministry on the west side of the LA church. We want this thing to go. It's going to take more than just a new campus minister. It's going to take all of our heart and energy, and I know we're all in for this. But as part of that process, today we're going to have a guest speaker who is a graduate of San Diego State. He, uh, he was our, our summer intern. Uh, we all know him. He graduated from Culver City High School. He's a proven, he's done some great work in campus ministry. I'm really grateful for him. Today, he's going to preach the word. After he preaches the word, if any of you would like to have a little question and answer, we're going to be back in the garden room for like a, uh, like a good half hour after service. So that if you have questions, you can ask him what he's thinking. Because I, I, as a congregation, as a staff, we'd like to make him an offer to be a campus minister. But we want to get everybody's opinion on it. We want to have questions asked. And uh, we're going to get to hear the word of God preach from a young man of God, but a powerful man of God, Mr. Justin Shump. Let's welcome him at this time. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Merry Christmas. It's the happiest time of the year. Uh, it's been great. I graduated college on Tuesday, so I'm done, which is exciting. Uh, I got a marketing degree from the San Diego State University. Go Aztec. Any Aztecs in the... There you go. Kawhi Leonard went to San Diego State University, so... And Steven Strasberg. Got some good athletes. Um, but yeah, I just want to say Merry Christmas. Um, it's really a great time to be here. Um, if we can just get this going. One moment. Okay, no worries. Uh, you guys look great. Love seeing the, the red and the green and everything that's going on. That's exciting. Um, yeah, it's really is a, it's encouraging to be back. Um, obviously, the West Side is home. Uh, so it's great to be home. It's great to be seeing everyone, seeing Tim Shaw's back from Germany. Uh, great seeing Tim. He got baptized out there and just seeing all the amazing faces. It really is just such a beautiful time. Um, so like I said, Merry Christmas. Um, so to kind of start off, Steve wanted me to share just kind of a little bit just about my life and kind of who I am. So I thought I'd just kind of go through some Christmas memories from my life and our family with you guys. Uh, to hopefully you can guys kind of get to know me a little bit better. Uh, and I also want to share some of the best Christmas gifts I ever got. So this was uh, Christmas 2004. Yes, that is Slime Kano, in case you guys weren't sure. This was this Hot Wheels set. Uh, and I thought this was literally the absolute coolest thing in the world. Uh, I was super hyped to get that. Um, this was Christmas 2006. I got a GameCube. Got a little more cheer. Uh, it was, it was, uh, I had Madden come with that, and it was playing football on it, and Lego Star Wars, and it was super fun. Uh, this was Christmas 2009. I got a ping pong table. Um, kind of a funny story with this was, obviously you can't fit a ping pong table under a tree. And so my mom kind of had it set up in the guest room and she had put a comforter over it. Um, and we had some relatives staying with us. My uncle was staying in that room. And so I woke up in the morning and I was super bummed that I, I didn't see a ping pong table anywhere. But I did see a mattress with a comforter that I could jump on. So I run in the air and I jump and I body slam the new ping pong table. Um, but I was super excited because I, I knew what it was. Um, this is Christmas 2010. Uh, that's me in the blue repping the UCLA Bruins parka. Um, we actually went on a trip with the Chows up to Flagstaff, Arizona. You can kind of see Nicole Chow. She's right there to my right. She got cropped out of the picture. Sorry, Nicole. 
Um, but it was a great time. Uh, it was my first and last time snowboarding. Uh, I didn't, didn't do too well. Um, Steve also said, you know, share some stupid things that you've done. Uh, so I kind of thought it'd be nice to include Christmas 2015. <laughs> As some of you guys might remember, uh, this is my senior year, and me and Ryan Toomey decided to make a Christmas rap album called Rapping Presents. <laughs> and we were promoting it and telling everyone about it, but we didn't tell people what it was. And so some parents got concerned, and pretty much they thought we were planning an attack on the school. Um, so we both got interrogated by the police, <laughs> and my parents thought about disowning me at that point. So. Those are just some of the kind of Christmas memories we've had. Um, you know, we're going to read uh, out of Luke chapter 2. You can turn there. Now, obviously, it is our Christmas service. Uh, and this time of year, we focus on the birth of Christ, the amazing birth that happens. And most of us have read uh, this story before, maybe many times. And we're going to be focusing on kind of the shepherds in the story of the birth. Um, so we're going to be talking about, a lot about shepherds. We're going to be talking a lot about sheep. And so my title for the lesson today is Fleece Navidad. <laughs> Hope you guys like that. If you don't like that title, you can come up with your own title. <laughs> Steve is regretting having me now. <laughs> uh, well, let's pick up in, uh, in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 6. So as while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and got into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Point number one, Jesus was born to save. And we've all read this passage. We know about the wise men kind of showing up and following the star. We know about the shepherds being told about Jesus. But for me, I kind of have to ask myself, why did the angels appear to shepherds? You know, it's interesting, if you think logically, they probably should have showed up to, to the preachers of the law or the priests. You know, these people would have been well-versed in the messianic prophecies. They studied the scripture as their entire life. Their entire life was devoted to studying the scripture. The priests and the teachers of the law would have known better than anyone else in all of Israel about the Messiah, about the prophecies. And you know, they were anticipating this Messiah. There was great anticipation in Israel about who this Messiah would be. And the kind of common held belief was that he was going to be a great military leader, you know, similar to like a David or a Joshua. Because at the time, the Jews were under Roman oppression. And so it was believed that God's Messiah would come and rescue them and save them from the, from the oppression. You know, the fact that we know who Jesus is, it's easy to kind of look down on the Jews for thinking that. We talked about that even when we studied the Bible people. You know, everyone kind of misinterpreted who Jesus was. But if you read the Old Testament, it kind of makes sense why they thought this. Because it was a pattern all throughout Jewish history that when the Jews were in trouble, or when they were oppressed, or found themselves in a difficult situation, God sent a savior. He sent a strong leader. And a lot of the times, he was a military leader. And so from Genesis to Malachi, God kind of sprinkled all these little hints 
about who this Messiah would be. There's all these prophecies in the Old Testament you can read about. So the priests and the teachers of the law, they would have known these hints. They would have known the messianic prophecies. So why didn't the angel reveal himself to the priests or the teachers of the law? Why did the angels choose the shepherds, the dudes who were hanging out with the sheep and the goats all day? You know, to kind of answer this question, we have to understand kind of, one, who these shepherds were and also the context of what's going on in this passage. It was believed that the, the shepherds in this passage were working in the fields by the Migdal Eder. In Hebrew, that translates to the Tower of the Flock. So this was a tower that stood close to Bethlehem on the road to Jerusalem. And it was used as a military lookout and also as a way for shepherds to keep watch over their sheep. It has some significance in the book of Genesis as the place where Rachel, the son of Jacob, the father of Israel, was buried. It's also briefly referenced in Micah chapter 4 as a prophecy about the Messiah. So Jewish scholars believed that the Migdal Eder was going to be the place where the Messiah was revealed. This was a commonly held belief. Not only did the Jews have the Old Testament, not only did they have the kind of Bible that we have, but they also had this text called the Talmud. And in the first part of the Talmud, it's called the Mishnah. And it's the first kind of major collection of, of oral rabbinic literature. And one of the regulations in the Talmud states, expressively forbids the keeping of flocks throughout the land of Israel, except in the wilderness. And the only flocks otherwise kept would be those for the temple services. You see, the sheep that pastured at the Migdal Eder were not ordinary sheep. These were the sheep that were used for temple sacrifices. And these shepherds were not ordinary shepherds. They were watching over the temple flock. And these sheep were extremely important to the people of Israel. You see, in the Old Testament, the way that God allowed his people to deal with sin was through animal sacrifice. And most of these sacrifices involved using a bull or a sheep or a goat. And you'd place your hands on the animal and you sacrifice it. And there's various rituals you can read about in the book of Leviticus for various types of sin. And there were two major holidays in the Jewish calendar that involved animal sacrifice. Two of the most important being Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, and Pesach, known as Passover. On the Day of Atonement, a goat was sacrificed for the sins of all of Israel as the scapegoat. And then another goat was released into the wilderness and was spared. And so this holiday was about both observing punishment and grace. You know, Passover was celebrated in remembrance of the exodus out of Egypt. During the exodus, every Jewish family slaughtered a, gro a lamb and put their blood on their doorframe so that the angel would pass over their houses and spare the Jewish people their firstborn. And so to the Jews, these holidays were extremely important. This was kind of like their Christmas. This is when everyone got together for Passover. And for us, these holidays also have importance. It's different. You see, to the Jewish people, this is all about their history, about their heritage. And it was a huge event in Jerusalem when Passover would happen. You know, it's recorded by one historian that over 200,000 lambs were slaughtered one year at Passover. You know, as a Christian, the holidays are still important because they foreshadow Christ. You see, just as the lamb was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement, Jesus was sacrificed for our sins. You know, we are that goat that's set free. Just as the blood of the lamb was spread on Passover and the Israelites were spared from God's wrath, well, it's the same with Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood spares us and allows God's wrath to pass over. And what's crazy about these lambs used for the sacrifices is they couldn't have any defects. They had to be absolutely perfect. One broken bone, one bruise, and they cannot be sacrificed for sin. You know, as a Christian, Jesus is our perfect lamb. He lived a sinless life. He didn't have any blemishes. 
He represents that lamb to us. It's the reason why we can have a relationship with God. Now, because we have the completed Bible, it's easy to see these connections. You can look at the Old Testament. You can look at who Jesus was. We know that he died. So we can say, yes, he was the lamb. He is our sacrifice. But I think what's kind of crazy about this nativity scene of Mary and Joseph being in this cave and giving birth is I don't think Mary understood the baby she was holding in her arms. Because how could she? How could she know that this was the Lamb of God? How could she know that this little baby would be brutally murdered? And look at the language in Luke chapter 1, verse 29. It says, But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. This sounds like the military leader that the Jews were expecting. Son of the Most High, sitting on a throne, ruling over Israel, a kingdom that will never end. You know, it's safe to assume that at this moment, Mary thinks she's holding the next king of Israel. Mary thinks that she's holding the person who will be the next powerful leader. But she did not know this was the Lamb of God. That's why I think God brought the shepherds. You know, having the shepherds who watched over the temple flock show up and be the first ones to see Jesus, this can't be an accident. God's much too clever. You know, it says that Mary pondered these things. She treasured them and pondered them because she didn't understand. Why are these shepherds showing up? Why did the angel tell them? She's pondering these things in her heart. You see, I think the shepherds understood. Because when the angels bring the shepherds their message, the language is different. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Jesus is called a Savior. Nothing about sitting on a throne, nothing about ruling over people, nothing about a kingdom just a savior. And this is why the angels appeared to the shepherds. This is why God chose them to be the first to know about Jesus' birth. Because a shepherd who watched over the temple flock would have known better than anyone in all of Israel that Israel needed a savior. They supplied the lambs for the day of atonement. They supplied the lambs for the Passover. I mean, imagine the pressure of raising a perfect animal. One broken bone, one bruise, one blemish, and it's over. Sins aren't forgiven. So they spent every minute of every day taking care of these animals, watching over them, protecting them from harm, only to see them brutally murdered. Sometimes thousands at a time. Because Israel had a problem with sin. And it was the same thing year after year after year. So to hear that the Messiah has been born, the Savior for all people, this is the greatest news they could have ever heard. To anyone else, a baby lying in a manger would have been a joke. But not if he's a Savior. You know, initially, they probably should have been mad at little baby Jesus because he was going to put them out of business. Because once he died, you wouldn't need lambs to slaughter. Once God's wrath was satisfied, there'd be no, no more need for goats. But they were overjoyed. You know, I, I think it's kind of similar to if you went to a doctor and told them you have the cure for cancer. They'd be ecstatic. Because they would know better than anyone how devastating that disease is. 
or if you went to a therapist and said, we found the cure for depression, they wouldn't be upset. They wouldn't be upset if they never had to see another patient, if they lost all of their business, because a therapist would have known better than anyone how devastating depression is. They would have sat through thousands of hours of listening to people talk about the pain and the anxiety and the thoughts of suicide. And so to hear that there's a cure, to hear that there's an end to the pain and suffering would have been the greatest feeling in the world. You know, I think the shepherds felt the same way. They would have seen hundreds of thousands of innocent little animals die because Israel's sin could not go unpunished. And they knew that Israel needed a savior, not another prophet, not another king, not another military leader, a savior. And so we have to ask ourselves today, as a church, as God's people in 2019, do we still feel the need for a savior? Do we still feel the eagerness the shepherds felt? I mean, after seeing Jesus, they couldn't contain their excitement. They just start evangelizing. They start spreading the news. Do we as a church feel compelled to do the same thing? You know, if I think to my answer to that question, I feel ashamed. Because naturally, I don't always feel the need for a savior. It almost feels like the longer I'm a Christian, the less I really feel the need for a savior. And it's rooted in pride and, and a desire for control, feeling like I have to prove my salvation. You know, I'm naturally a very critical person, and so I constantly feel this anxiety of myself having to improve, but then reflecting that onto others and feeling like everyone around me has to also constantly be improving. I can be critical towards people, I can be critical about the way we do church, and all gets based on human effort. And so Jesus becomes less of a person who can save me and more of a person who can help me improve. You know, I've grown up in church the whole life, and so I've grown accustomed to feeling the need to be helped. I've grown accustomed to feeling the need to be supported. But not the feeling of the need to be saved. And there's a huge difference between being helped and being saved. For instance, let's say I'm driving in a car with Kenny. While we're driving, I start texting. I'm on my phone. I don't advise that. And I get distracted, and I start swerving to the other lane. And there's a semi-truck coming right towards us. At the last second, Kenny reaches over and grabs the wheel and swerves over. And we get out of time right away, right before hitting the truck. And I'm telling the story. There's a difference between saying, Kenny helped me avoid a car accident, and Kenny saved my life. You see, saying Kenny helped me denotes that I had some power in it. Kenny helped. Kenny supported. But saying that he saved me shows that it was all because of him. I had nothing to do with it. And so sadly, church has kind of become this place that we go for help. And Jesus becomes this person who can fix our lives. And we start hearing these statements, okay, yeah, if I'm a Christian, I'll be happier. If I'm a Christian, my relationships will get better. If I'm a Christian, I'll be successful in my career. And Christianity becomes all about self-improvement and less about being saved. You know, Jesus came as a savior. And this is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. You see, in every other religion, you have a central figure who brought new moral teaching. And if you follow that new moral teaching, you'll be close to God, or you'll go to heaven, or you'll achieve nirvana, or you'll be reincarnated. Jesus taught that he is the way, not a new way to live. Jesus did not come to help us be better people. He come, came to save us. Jesus didn't come to give us the tools to help us be more moral. Jesus is the tool. And so if you want a religion that is just about self-improvement, you're probably not at the right service. There's probably not another religion you can find that will help you be a better person morally. You see, the shepherds gathered to see a savior. We gather because we want to be saved. Not to improve, not to have better stats. 
We gather because Jesus died. Which leads me into my second and final point. He was born to die. You know, Jesus' sole purpose in life was to be the Lamb of God. His purpose was not to heal sickness. It was not to perform miracles. It was not to improve the Jewish people's morality. He did all those things, and those things are great, but he did those things to prove who he was so they would understand his death. He did not come to do those things. You know, Jesus did not even come to bring new teaching about repentance and baptism. That's not why he came. And it wasn't a new teaching. You see, John the Baptist was already preaching repentance and baptism long before Jesus got on the scene. I mean, look at this scripture right here in Luke 3. Talking about John the Baptist. He went into all country around Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The people said, what shall we do them? It's a very similar scene to Acts 2. What shall we do, the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what shall we do? Don't collect any more money than you are required to, he told them. Then some of the soldiers asked him, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money. and Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Jesus wasn't the first to convince the tax collectors to get baptized. Jesus wasn't the first to convert the military leader. Jesus wasn't the first to bring new teaching about repentance and baptism. John was. And these things are really good. And we know these things are good. Repentance, the cleansing water of baptism, generosity. But John knew something greater was coming. He knew that what he was doing could not compare at all to who Jesus was. How do we know this? John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was so that he might be revealed to Israel. Everything John did was so that the world would know that Jesus was the Lamb of God. Everything Jesus did, he did to prove to the people that he was the Lamb of God. If we only knew about his birth and we only knew about his death, that's all we would need. And we can get so distracted by everything in between. Everything in between is important. It's there for a purpose. It was to convince the Jewish people who Jesus was. But the most important thing about Jesus is that he was born, he was God, and he died. He was the lamb. This is not about self-improvement. This is not about kingdom stats. He didn't come to set the Jewish people free from the Romans. He didn't come to bring a new teaching. He didn't come to start a new religion. He came to die. He came to be the Lamb of God. And this is why he was born in a cave. It's not an accident there was no room at the inn. God doesn't make accidents. It's not an accident he was laid on a pile of hay. And it's not an accident that the shepherds of the temple flock were the first to visit him. You see, from day one, Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah. Ten minutes out of the womb, he's preaching his first sermon. Everything about his life, even his birth, pointed to his death. And it's because of that death that we are saved. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Merry Christmas. Love you guys.